It's been five years since the global financial collapse. In its wake, fear and economic uncertainty dominated much of the world. And while some of the major players are making gains towards recovery, there are many stumbles along the way. What can be done to turn things around and how can countries and international institutions come together to move the global economy forward? CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, just had its annual conference look at exactly those questions and we're now joined by five of the attendees. Here they are. Mike Callahan, he's Executive Director of the Australian Treasury's International Division. Cyrus Rustamji is Director of the Commonwealth Secretariat's Economic Affairs Division. Inga Cowell is Adjunct Professor at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin, Germany. Besma Momani, Senior Fellow at CG. And Gordon Smith, Distinguished Fellow at CG. And we welcome all of you around this table here, and thank you for coming to TVO tonight for uh, what we think is going to be a very interesting discussion about the state of play in the world's economy these days. And I want to start with a clip. This is from the CG website, uh, outlining what the conference that you all just attended was all about, because we want to bring our viewers in on this too. Roll tape. Five years ago, the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States erupted, plunging the global economy into the worst recession since the Great Depression as output, employment, and trade all collapsed. Five years on, the global financial crisis continues to cast a pall on the global economy that remains dangerously unbalanced and is threatened by new fragilities. We have, of course, talked about the economy, the global economy, a lot on this program, but we have rarely had the opportunity to get people representing so many different parts of the world all together at one table. So, Mike, we're going to go as far away as possible, down under, and start with you. Uh, the pace of the global economy and what needs to happen next. From the Australian vantage point, what are you seeing? Well, I think it's very clear in terms of what the risks are that are confronting the global economy now. Uh, they are what's happening in Europe. The concern there that we may see a destabilising of the financial conditions in Europe with the debt crisis they had. And what's all over the press has been throughout the weekend is the fiscal cliff. What's happening in the... Uh, United States. But these are immediate things that are confronting the global economy. But I think what is required is going to be this long period of sustained progress in policies because they're very complex, very difficult issues that many countries are dealing with. So really we have now, we've got some immediate concerns, some immediate vulnerabilities, but they're going to take time. Long period meaning? Well, we had the, uh, <laughs> the chief economist of the IMF say that this could go on for a decade. Uh, perhaps the first five years have passed. But even now, if we look at the fiscal cliff, what we're talking about is just overcoming an immediate concern, but the US has to have a, a medium-term con fiscal consolidation plan over a number of years and have to deliver that. And this is, the, in Europe, it's the competitiveness problems. There's immediate financing, but you've got to improve the competitiveness of the southern countries. That will take years. Okay, you mentioned Europe, so let me go to Germany. Germany is, of course, the powerhouse of the EU right now, but you're surrounded by some other countries that aren't so powerful. What's the mood there right now? The mood is mixed. We see the problems we have, especially in the southern part uh, of Europe. At the same time, uh, we have uh, countries in Europe, like Germany, where growth is still quite strong. It's slowing. We have 6.8% unemployment. And we are watching carefully uh, China and we are watching the US because we are strongly export-led. So in Germany, you at present actually have two debates. First, the anxious debate, how do we weather the storm in the short term? But then you have a, a, a lot of attention being paid to another topic, and that is, of course, we need growth in Europe, we need growth in the world, but what sort of growth? So the uh, debate what, what, what sort of growth? Wouldn't all growth is be it, great? Is it? Yeah, no, have growth, but sustainable growth. Ah. That is in line with the environment, that uh, meets social concerns, and that is more longer term and uh, durable. So uh, when you look at the papers, you will see plenty of attention being devoted to how do we uh, uh, go through in time through the energy revolution, we need uh, renewable energy sources that need to be developed. How do we distribute the growth? Where is our comparative advantage uh, in uh, the future? So I hope that in all the debates uh, we have in future, uh, we will aim for growth and bring everybody along. But at the same time, not forget this question, 
of what sort of growth is really sustainable. The right growth, sustainable growth. Okay. Cyrus, you are looking at a vast panoply of countries. You, you've got your eye on the Commonwealth, which is very rich and very poor. So how do you get a sense of how the economies in those countries are doing? Quite complex. Uh, there are many different parts of the Commonwealth. There are the advanced economies. Uh, Commonwealth is a club of 54 countries. It has five members that are G20 members, so advanced economies or uh, systemically important economies. It has 32 countries that are small states with populations very low, a million and a half or less. Among those are 25 that are island states. There are many uh, least developed countries, 15 of them. There are large numbers of countries in the sub-Saharan African region, in South Asia, in the Pacific and the Caribbean. So no single answer, perhaps, to uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. But very, very different types of challenges. If you take um, Sub-Saharan Africa as an example, they have now got back to the growth rates that they had pre-crisis. They've managed to do that um, by virtue of a range of different things, including very, very solid macro policies and uh, institutional reforms within their countries. Our viewers may not know that. Some of the highest growth rates in the world today are in Africa. Absolutely right. Hmm. Absolutely. Pre-crisis between 2000, just to throw a few statistics at you, for, between 2000 and 2006, sub-Saharan African countries grew at 5.5 percent. Then the crisis happened and they went their different ways through the crisis, but now um, we have from the IMS projections that our member countries and the Commonwealth member countries in sub-Saharan Africa will grow at 5.6 percent in the, by the end of this year hmm. and moving forward. So their challenges are not growth uh, per se, um, which are the challenges of the advanced economies right now, trying to kickstart growth again, trying to hold growth levels if you're a dynamic emerging market, uh, Brazil or India. Their challenge is that there is good growth, good solid growth, but it's jobless and it's also unequal. Hmm. So. And that, that plays very much into another thing that's, uh, uh, that's been discussed at the conference, which has been very valuable, the many, many different tectonic shifts that are taking place in the global environment. Demographic changes are really quite enormous. If we take Africa as an example. By 2020, it'll have a population of a billion people. But by 2035, 15 years later, it'll have a population of 1.4 billion and a half of those will be under 24. So the challenges are now altogether different. How hear, do you deal I'm with sorry, that? I hear similar demographic challenges in the Middle East, which you've got your eye on. Uh, how would you kind of characterize the economic situation there right now? Yeah, it's very similar to Africa. In fact, when you look at uh, many of the, the features of the Middle East economies, I'm actually very hopeful in, in the medium to long term. Uh, because of the demographic situation, I mean, we saw what was notoriously called the youth bulge in the case of the Arab Spring. But that very youth bulge is actually a positive thing when you think of it in terms of right. economics, in that it's where when innovation happens, it's when productivity happens, it's where consumerism happens. So th there's a great prospects there for growth. In fact, many of the Middle East countries, and there's a big variety, of course, between oil exporting and non-oil exporting. But we had in some of the non-oil exporting countries, even countries like Egypt were reporting 5% GDP growth rates. Um, you know, this is immediately two years after the financial crisis. So they were doing well, of course, as many of these countries that have had the Arab Spring are going through their transition, uh, like Egypt, like Tunisia, that are highly dependent on, uh, on tourism. They're experiencing a lot of difficulty at the moment. But you know, the, the situation in the Middle East, I think, is, is very promising for the future. The demographics are there. You took a, take a country like Libya, for example, 2% of the world's oil wealth and 7 million people. And there's no reason why that country can't be Norway. What the challenge is, is that we had leaders in many of these countries that were notoriously corrupt and that didn't want to redistribute to their, to their people. So I think the concept of growth is really important, but we do need to think about what kind of growth, back to Inji's point. Inclusive growth is what we need, which is jobs, jobs, jobs. Not building towers, not building resorts, not building all of these you know, false symbols of advancement and modernization, but don't actually put food on the table of a lot of people. So there are enormous challenges, policy challenges, before many of these countries, but the prospects are really excellent for much of the region. Hmm. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. You're a former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Canada, and you've now got your eye on the G20, which are the 20 allegedly best economies in the world. What are the debates that are happening in that exclusive club? Well, there are, uh, there are Im very important debates that are occurring, and a lot of people are criticizing the G20 for not having uh, 
uh, accomplished more, not having decided more. I think it's really important, and this is something we talked about over the, the weekend at CG, it's really important to look why. Uh, and I want to focus on the political dimension. Uh, Europe is in obviously considerable disarray. Uh, it's really not in the end clear uh, uh, how and when Europe is going to exit from its present problems. I mean, in Greece, it's quiet this week, but what could happen in two weeks or four weeks, we don't know. So Europe has got to get its act together. The United States, of course, now that the election has passed, is the United States going to succeed in uh, avoiding this fiscal cliff? Uh, it's not clear, but again, it's fundamentally a political problem and whether the political leadership is going to be such that will uh, bring it together. And finally, although people don't often put this in the same category, there's China also, as we meet going through fundamental change. So there are enormous political strains that are taking place. And I think that uh, in, in, in these three areas, China, uh, Europe, and the United States, uh, we, are at, we are saying get your acts together. These are important issues we've got to grapple with in the G20. But the fundamental problem is not a problem with the G20, I think we've concluded over the weekend. The problem is with some of the, with some of the key elements in the G20 that really aren't able to act in the way they need to to deal with the challenges uh, that are uh, in front of them. We've already heard the expression fiscal cliff a few times on this program. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to hear it <laughs> if we watch the media or read magazines or newspapers thousands of times. And I want to get a sense from, Mike, start us off again if you would. This Congress has to come to grips with this fiscal cliff, we're told, by the end of the year or else. What kind of confidence do you have in Australia that they're going to figure this out? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're hoping, we're praying that they do figure it out. But one of the concerns, I think, is that if they just push the can down the road, if they go for a temporary, just push, delay the tax uh, increases, put it off, because I think one of the major problems that the world's facing now and the US is facing is uncertainty. That's holding things back. People aren't investing, people aren't consuming because of uncertainty. Political gridlock is causing that uncertainty. Now what the US needs, it needs to avoid the fiscal, lift, uh, the fiscal cliff, can't have the massive contraction from withdrawing the fiscal impulse, uh, but it does need to have a credible fiscal consolidation plan. <laughs> Apart from the fiscal cliff, the other concern that we saw with the debt ceiling Last year, the lifting of the debt ceiling is a concern about the sustainability, potential sustainability of the US fiscal position. Can it pay its bills if it has this massive debt? So it's got to get this balance right between avoiding the cliff but getting in a credible plan and do it and build some confidence. Now, we're all hoping and relying that good sense is going to break out between the Democrats and the Republicans. How often does that happen? Well, this is the worry, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Bestman, when you look at it, you've got a, a Senate that seems impossibly deadlocked. You've got the House still in the hands of the Republicans. And you've got a president who, while getting a good victory in the Electoral College, frankly, mm. won by 1%. Yeah. What, uh, t are those the elements of of a solution? Well, you know, it's really, uh, it's a country that's obviously very polarized at the moment, and, and, and part of that is because there's a there's two conversations going simultaneously, and unfortunately, I think there isn't a lot of meeting of minds on this issue. But, you know, I think it's a global problem. There are two debates out there, uh, one on how much austerity is right, it's too much of it is, is, is not a good thing, and how much stimulus is needed in order to kickstart these economies. And we've been dealing with this, this challenge for the past five years in practically every country, how much is too much of one or the other. And I think that the United States, you know, we've just entered or just finished four years of, of Obama where the stimulus track was tried as well here as in Canada. And now I think we're reverting back to that push to, to bring in more of that austerity now that hopefully we've sort of, uh, uh, you know, gone through the worst of the, of the Great Recession. But, you know, it's a challenge throughout the entire globe. And I think policymakers don't have an easy task uh, on, on how to exactly position themselves on that. I'm actually going to quote you a little bit more because you've got this piece on the CG Online website at cgonline.org in which you say, and let's bring this up for everybody to look at it, at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and World Bank Group annual meetings in Tokyo, we saw a very exciting and relevant debate that meeting participants will not soon forget. Fiscal consolidation, or budget cutting to get in line with incomes, was a key buzzword. While there was often little disagreement on the need for fiscal consolidation, at least among those speaking in Tokyo, the pace and specificity of these cuts was indeed debated and contested. So let's get into this a bit more. Cyrus, on the issue of the debate that the world is having on whether we need more austerity or more stimulus, where are you? Well, I, again, I'd like to come at it from the perspective of poor and small and developing countries. 
I think they've had that discourse themselves for many, many years, actually. I think the austerity, um, the, the, the polarized nature of the, the way it's uh, presented is something that they've been challenged with for many, many years. They haven't had fiscal space themselves. They have, um, in many uh, instances, required to satisfy conditionalities which have driven them to adopt austere um, fiscal stances and uh, curb expenditure. Now, what is very interesting in all of this, and again, something that I think came out reasonably well during the conference, is that for those types of countries, they've been through a quite significant period of adjustment themselves. What they're demonstrating now is a certain type of innovation and competitiveness, which is allowing countries, for example, the ones in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that I mentioned, to find pathways to regenerate growth. I think this is very important because I think if the fiscal cliff issue is uh, avoided in the US and if certainty is brought to the direction of the global economy, it will catalyze quite a momentum of higher growth, of job-inducing growth, in developing countries. And that's I a huge if. That's it, a huge it, it, if. It's, it's a huge if, but what, what, what is important about the, hu the, the, the if is that if it doesn't happen, innovation is already happening in the poorest of developing countries. Mm -hmm. Innovation is happening, South-South collaboration is happening, South-South trade is um, uh, ramping up. Already right now, and this is not at all to suggest that they should try to um, n to de-link in any way from traditional markets. But the reality of these countries is that their trade base is starting to diversify, uh, become much more nuanced, much more calibrated to where competition uh, can be sustained. 30% of uh, least developed countries merchandise exports today of the poorest countries of the world and of the small vulnerable economies of the world is now going to emerging markets. So there are other types of self-sustaining dynamics that are starting to take place in this multipolar global environment. If, a big if, but if global uncertainty starts to alleviate, it sets up for a really very promising future prognosis for many, many developing countries. I think that's a very valuable um, forward-looking prospect for, for the type of dynamism that's coming broadly, one says, from the south, but from developing countries okay. as a whole. Inga, let me ask you, it's a very hopeful prognosis. Does it have any basis in reality? I think uh, it has a basis in reality because it's happening. Yeah. So that uh, uh, is clearly a reality. But I wanted to come back, if I may, to a point that Gordon made earlier, that the EU is in a mess. One can see it, the EU being in a mess, but one can also put a positive spin on it because we were in a mess all along, only we had covered it up. We had introduced the euro too early, too politically, and now we are building the institutions that we need in order to really have a sound euro in the future. So I think we have to sort of learn to have a little patience and tolerance for transformation and for change and not just see it as being messy and disturbing, but moving uh, forward. Well, it's that's a mess, but at least you're dealing with the mess now. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's progress. And uh, my second <laughs> point concerns the fiscal cliff. I'm, I think sound fiscal policy, it goes without saying. You know? And I'm quite optimistic that uh, the US will manage, because since two days I'm reading in the Financial Times that business wants it. So if business is behind it, maybe uh, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats will uh, come together. But what worries me is that we are focusing on fiscal cliff, fiscal cliff, fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff, this fiscal cliff will be a blip in the history books, if any at all, in future. Yeah? But the environmental cliff is there to destroy the planet. Hmm. So how come? A few days ago, we had this hurricane, and everything is in shambles. And we don't sit here and talk about the environmental cliff. Then there is a third cliff, and that's the equity cliff. You know, you should see the uh, income statistics, how they are moving apart. You know, and the income distribution becoming more and more inequitable within countries, the richer countries, including Germany, and uh, in Africa, 
Yeah? So we really have to ask this question, how do we avoid the environmental cliff? How do we avoid uh, the social cliff that we already see bubbling? Yeah? And then compared to that, I think the fiscal cliff is doable. Gordon, which of the three cliffs do you want to jump off first? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, let me make clear that on the European Union, the real story is what an enormous amount has been achieved over the last five decades. Uh, and rem remembering that, that the origin of the European Union was to create a security community so France and Germany could never go back to war. The building of Europe has been a, I mean, a, a difficult process, a strange process, I would say, because the leaders get out ahead, there's a crisis, and then there's a reaction to it. But so, so you've, got, you've got to understand that the, what the Europeans are trying to do is very complicated, and they're trying to do it with more countries, more and more countries, and that makes it complicated. Mm. So I don't want it all uh, to leave the impression that, that, that the European Union isn't a success, but it, dealing with this particular set of problems, for the reasons I think we've discussed here, uh, is, uh, is, is pr proving to be a, a huge challenge. And again, how long is it going to take? Uh, the kind of question that Mike was, was, worrying, was, say, was speaking about. But I wanted to comment on climate change. Again, Inga's totally right on, on environmental questions. Uh, I did note that when uh, President Obama last week gave his speech uh, uh, acknowledging his, his, his victory in the election, he did mention the, the, the unmentionable during the election campaign, and that's climate change. So maybe that's a little indicator of good news. I sure hope so. But I do want to underline uh, also what Inga said about income disparities. Uh, we don't know in Canada anything like the kind of income disparities there are um, in the United States. I just had a friend who took the train from Washington to New York. And if you look out the window rather than have your eyes on a book or your computer, it's pretty astonishing what you see in what was an important part of the industrial heartland of the U.S. In other words, how bad it was. How bad it is. But mm -hmm. also in Africa. In Africa, too. Well, let's, given that we have these three massive challenges on the table right now, a fiscal cliff, an environmental cliff, an equity cliff, Besma, start us off on this. Much of the world has been looking to the major institutions of the world, World Bank, IMF, G20, call, you know, pick, pick your poison to get us out of all of this mess. How would you gauge the institution's uh, effectiveness at responding to the world's cries for solutions? Well, I mean, it, it really depends on, I think if you're on the receiving end, you may say that in fact, there hasn't been enough being done. But you know, the challenges for, for many of these institutions is they're dealing with a lot of vulnerabilities that aren't necessarily clear. Um, you know, the reality is we don't know uh, all of the interconnectedness in the world economy. When the international financial crisis hit us five years ago, we were all surprised. Uh, we were all taken back, even the experts, on how interconnected the global economy was. That, I think, is a cry for more governance. It's a cry for more creative solutions and understanding of their interconnectedness. Uh, but that also requires a lot of governments to cooperate. And in fact, the G20 was a great, I think, recognition of how sharing of information and having that, that, that forum uh, allowed for more effective governance. And we saw a lot of great momentum in the very early years of the G20. I'd say perhaps now we've seen a little bit of a decline, perhaps in that same sort of honeymoon phase that we saw in the first few years. Um, and now we're retreating, I think, and many of us uh, see many countries around the table no longer thinking of themselves as part of this public good uh, cause of trying to ensure that the global economy stays uh, as prosperous as it can be. And so we're retreating a lot to that sort of self-interested behavior in many countries. Uh, I think that there is uh, enormous challenges for, for these financial institutions to find a way out of these crises. And at the end of the day, we have to understand that this is very complex, and I speak beside people who have been around the table themselves, um, to really work out the, the nuts and bolts of the international system. I was going to say, Mike, do you, do you think these institutions have responded to the challenge properly? Yes, they have, but the most important point I think has been made is that we can't expect too much of them. They're not going to solve these problems. Countries are going to solve them. Political leadership, domestic political leadership is going to solve them. The IMF and the G20 aren't going to solve the fiscal cliff in the United States. They're not going to solve the mm -hmm. environmental cliff. Then. They're not going to solve the sustainability, the equity cliff. It's going to depend on the policies that countries implement. And what these institutions can do is provide the analysis in some times they provide the funding in terms of development and funding to overcome crisis etc but ultimately it's trying to bring the parties together to convince them to persuade them to do the right policies 
And it's not easy, it's not hard, the politics is always difficult. And this is the challenge, we can expect too much. And I, that's part of the problems is we blame the institutions where really it's at home, it's the policies that, the, the domestic policies that really matter. Having said that, Gordon, CG's in the, C, I mean, CG's about international governance. Your job is to give advice to these people. Yeah. Did they listen? Um, but how things have changed. I was the Sherpa or rep, personal representative of the Prime Minister for the 1995 uh, G7 and G8 summit. Well, that was Chrétien. That was Chrétien. The leaders, we're six around this table, they sat eight around a slightly larger table with one person behind them. So 14 or 16 people in the room, that's it. They called each other by their first name. They could see into each other's uh, eyes and faces. The G20, if you look at it, um, has uh, you know, upwards, I, I have seen a 500 people in the room. The mm -hmm. Leaders are going in and out. Uh, they're reading various things, I am widely told, by people who are actually in the meeting. So they don't have the kind of engagement they need, I think, to do what Mike has suggested, and that is that they've got to work with each other, they've got to shame each other, they've got to encourage each other to work together. I saw a dynamic in the 1990s where that really worked. And we worked because we were all sitting together. Except that people thought that that was a kind of a closed club that didn't admit too much of the world. And that's why the G20 had to be created, right. to get China and India and Brazil and so forth in. But, but you're in saying doing it's not so, as effective. Yeah, but it's not. No, but the, we didn't end up with 20 around the table. We, we've ended up with 50 around the table because there's the Minister of Finance as well mm. as the head of government. They're the, they're the heads of international institutions around the table. So how do you kick half and the people 50, out? It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. If yeah. the Russians won't do it, maybe the Australians will in two years, Mike. <laughs> what are you but, thinking of? Yeah. I mean, is there something wrong with me? No, no. Nothing wrong with you. Yeah. That's why you're because, here. Because uh, I'm, I was for years and years in these international institutions. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked very hard and very effectively. However, what you have to realize, and uh, I wish we would come away from saying the IMF or the World Bank. Mm -hmm. We are conference rooms. We are basically giving conference rooms to the powers of the world. And even if we, as staff members in these institutions, have bright ideas and brilliant uh, new proposals, our hands are often tied. So uh, okay. I really think we have to come back and say these are meeting places of governments, mainly, and the powers of this world. And what I have observed in all these um, uh, years that I worked there is that the, the world is acutely suffering, including the G20, from a problem that I have started calling the sovereignty paradox. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, government, Mrs. Merkel or Obama and others are trying to hold on to their sovereignty that they think they have uh, and shying away from cooperation. But in a world where you have decided to open up and which is marked by policy interdependence, the best thing in your national interest is to cooperate. You know? And that you can document in dollars and cents. If you were to cooperate on global financial regulation, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be tossed around by financial markets. Mm -hmm. If we were to do something about climate change, the hurricanes would probably subside a little bit, let's hope, at least sooner or later. So what we have to solve is this sovereignty paradox. We have to tell our leaders, we have to lead them, uh, in understanding that uh, in policy fields marked by policy interdependence, we have to cooperate. You know? And then they will look again like having capacity to make policy and effective uh, policy. Cyrus, so, how do you see this <laughs> paradox? I, I think there's a lot of mileage for developing countries in making existing institutions more effective. I think there are challenges in the governance structures of institutions, which is very, very important an issue to deal with, to give greater voice, get greater representation to developing countries in these institutions, and to have a, a clearer channel of entry into the G20, which is clearly a particular type of a club. Um, but I think that in each of the different types of institutions, there is value that is untapped. Um, Mike was saying that it's up to the countries to do the job uh, primarily, and I completely agree with that. I think without that foundation, nothing really can go forward. And so it's, it's, it would be unfair then to uh, criticize institutions that are not coming to the party. But I think in many cases now, since the crisis and since the last five years, 
we see a better quality of performance on the job by policy makers in developing countries, uh, better quality of macroeconomic policy management, better uh, micro policy uh, and institutional developments in countries, in developing countries. It's really a very positive picture out there um, if, if it's analyzed uh, uh, even, even in the most um, cursory way. There's some very, very good developments taking place. That is why growth rates have come back in the face of all of this. What's needed in the G20, what's needed for these types of countries, very poor developing countries, is a clear channel for them to express their needs and for global action to catalyze the types of resources and the types of institutional capacity support to help them. So for example, there are many, many small states in the world. They are so small that their own actions by themselves cannot get them to the to the, the state that they would like to. They need the support of the multilateral international system. It might be aid, it might be trade support, it might be a, a improved resources of the IMF, or it might be a, a better conditionality in IMF resources, or much, much faster dispersing resources. Or it may need innovation in providing facilities for disaster management or for catering for disasters and catastrophic risks. Okay, let me follow up with Besma on that then. Uh, how much, as you look at it, how much progress do you think has been made in allowing those emerging powers of the world to participate more fully in these international institutions that we're talking about? We still have a lot of room to, to go. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is not just a moral and democratic question, which, you know, one could argue there's a normative reason why we should have more people around the table. The reality is global economic power is shifting from the West to the rest, to quote others. And that's really fundamental. I mean, you know, one of the things that the international financial crisis taught us was how much capital was now making its way to developing countries, for good or for bad. Uh, capital is being held there. And so the center of economic growth is also going to be held there. And how do you get them engaged in an international economic system so that we don't have this hoarding effect, which is what we saw with the global imbalances? How do we get them to participate, whether it's putting that money into institutions like the International Monetary Fund or into the, the entire globalized system? The last thing we need to do is, as Angie mentioned, is to really become self-interested actors. But I think, unfortunately, uh, as, the, as the world economy is shifting, we've had a sort of uh, incapability among the Western economies to recognize the fact that global economic power and strength is no longer with them. Mm. It has shifted, it is shifting. And as the South is watching this go by, they're trading amongst each other at an increasingly you know, uh, rapid rate. They are developing, they are innovating. I mean, they're, they're kind of moving on without the West. And the West is continuing to try to hold on to these seats of power, whether it's the World Bank and the IMF, without really thinking about the long-term health mm. of these institutions by engaging many of these countries in the process of decision making. Mike, where does Australia see itself in this? Because you're, you're, you know, in the North-South dialogue, you're in the South, but you're really in the Northern country. You're, you're part of the West, but you're really not in the West. <laughs> well, well, we, well, our future is very much in Asia. We see it relying in Asia. Right. But we have always been strong supporters of this, that there, there is an enormous change taking place yeah. in the global economy. And it's going to continue. Just over the weekend, the OECD put out a report projecting out to, I think, 2050. And you can always criticise these projections, but they're saying that you're going to see this continued growth of China, India, Brazil, and they're going to come. And the major sources of growth are already the emerging markets now, and it's going to just continue over the next 25 years. There'll be blips along the way, but that's the trend. And I think, yeah, we've been strong supporters, and again, because we're there, we're living it, we're, we're, we're our major trading partner is China, we've seen we, the growth that's taken place in China. And we, these organisations, they have to reflect the changing structure of the world economy. But the other point I'd make is that all the parties have to play their part. The emerging markets, when they come in, when they take the seat at the table, they have to play their part. They have to be constructive. They can't be, they have to contribute to global public goods. They can't just block in a narrow self-interest. So there's a lot of people. The West is having to change. I think the emerging markets, they're having to change in terms of being a, a global player. Uh, China, it is the second largest economy now. It has to act like the second largest economy. It can't take a narrow, self-interested view in international forums, international meetings. They have to be seen to be constructive. So we're all having to change, and I think there's a role for all countries, including countries like Australia, to try and be constructive, to be in there, to try and bring people together, to try and drive things along 
as much as you can. Let me take that answer and put it over to Inga here, the Chinese. They're having a once a decade now leadership transition. Do you have any more hope that the new leadership will do some of the things that Mike just outlined? Well, I think uh, they are already playing a positive role. But again, let me step back in order to make my point clear. Uh, economic power is not a fixed cake. It, it, it is an expanding cake. And therefore, also, I would uh, watch out for language there. The, the uh, conventionally powerful countries are not losing power. They are still strong and having military and economic mm -hmm. might. But others also gain power. So I think if we put it this way, then uh, it has a more positive spin and doesn't sound so frightening to the uh, conventional uh, powers. And coming back to the Chinese, let's say in Copenhagen at the climate change conference, I think they played a very positive role there. You may call it blocking, but I would say it's a positive role. Why? Because finally they got their act together with other developing countries and said, no kidding anymore, you conventional powers. If you want to move on climate change, then please let's all put the money on the table and let's have a fair contribution. So I thought it was actually a positive step that was taken by the developing countries. Otherwise, in previous days, they would have said, yeah, yeah, OK, we go along. And then one would have reneged on an agreement and climate change uh, would have uh, progress. So I think we must come to look at international negotiations more as a market and not as a state type thing. I, and the more competitive, the better. I've got about a minute and a half left. And Cyrus, I saw your eyebrows rise when she was sure. speaking. Sure. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sense of urgency in developing countries. They may be doing well. And the, the opportunity for enjoying a bigger economic cake is a wonderful opportunity. But there's urgency. There's urgency in sustainable nature of their development, in climate change, in rising sea levels, for example. They are biodiversity challenges. There are enormous costs of new public goods, of financing the infrastructure just to keep them competitive. So for me, in multilateral systems and multilateral processes, there ought to be a greater sense of urgency and cohesion for the benefit of the world's poorest and smallest and most vulnerable developing countries. Anything that delays that, for me, is something that is a step back. And I think it's a very, very urgent uh, set of situations in, in, in regard to climate change, and particularly because global processes are moving towards definitive um, rules in areas that are very, very important for developing countries. On climate change, on the post-2015 Millennium Development Goal Framework, the, development, the Framework for Development uh, Cooperation and Development um, Rules for uh, the, the nature of the uh, goals that will be set in development post-2015. There are major conferences coming forward in the next couple of years. And if the, if the dynamic, urgent nature of this is not grasped by the G20, by the Bretton Woods institutions and others, we'll lose something. And we'll keep an eye on it. I want to thank all of you for coming around our table today here at TVO and to discuss these very important issues. Mike Callahan, Executive Director of the Australian Treasury's International Division. Cyrus Rustamji, Director of the Commonwealth Secretariat's Economic Affairs Division. Inga Cowell from the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin, Germany. Besma Momani, Senior Fellow at CG. Gordon Smith, Distinguished Fellow at CG. Thanks so much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.